Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Noblet. I'm Community Manager for the Diagram Center at Benetech here in Palo Alto, California. I'm really delighted to welcome you today to our webinar, An Introduction to the New Accessible Image Sample Book. Our purpose here today is to give you a guided tour of that book, which just launched yesterday, and let you know where you can get a copy of it for yourself and uh, conclude with some information about how you can learn more. So uh, first of all, just a little bit of housekeeping. We have many, many registrants uh, for our webinar today from all over the world. We really welcome you and thank you for being here. Uh, in order for everyone to have the best audio experience possible, all of you have been placed on mute. So uh, you can hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, uh, please type your question into the chat window that you should be able to see. And if you uh, want to practice um, doing that, go ahead and just say hello uh, to the group um, right now. Uh, and so we will collect these questions uh and answer them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. We'll stop at about 10 minutes before the hour. Our session today is... Ooh, I see all the hellos coming in. That's great. Uh, if you need to leave before the end of this webinar, that's no problem. A recording of the webinar is going to be available along with the PowerPoint slides on the Diagram uh, webinars page within about a week. So you can come back and listen to it at your leisure. You can share with colleagues. Um, it's, it, it'll be freely available. So before we jump in, um, I just want to uh, take five minutes and give you a quick picture to, to uh, orient you to the big picture, the context in which this book was created, and tell you a little bit about Benetech. Um, we're a nonprofit social enterprise based, as I said, in Palo Alto, California. We develop technology in service of human rights, global literacy, and the environment. Now, the Diagram Center, where I work, is a partnership of Benetech, the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH in Boston, and the U.S. Fund for DAISY. We're funded by the U.S. Office of Special Education Projects, or otherwise known as OSEP. And our goal is to make it easier, faster, and cheaper uh, to create and use accessible images. So the Diagram Center has a laser focus on digital images. And why is that? Well, because screen readers already handle text very well. But often there's no way for a reader to know what an image contains unless it's described or unless another alternative is available. So what you see here on the screen is a collection of complex images in a biology textbook. And in cases like these, if the image has not been pretty thoroughly described in the text, uh, alt text simply is not <coughs> sufficient to convey the meaning of the image. So our work... Uh, includes a lot of attention to math as well because mathematical equations are very often rendered as images in digital books. So uh, as I said, all of our work focuses on a single question. What is required to make it easier for all content creators, from publishers creating tech textbooks to teachers creating handouts for their class, what's required to make images accessible? <clears throat> Uh, and we know the need is great. Um, <clears throat> what you're seeing on your slide here is some statistics that come from the United States. Um, 6.4 million students aged uh, 3 to 21 receive services under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. A little more than 2 million uh, students in two- and four-year post-secondary institutions qualify for accommodation, too. So that, that amounts to about 11% of all students in the U.S. who have some type of disability that qualifies them for services. So that's, you know, one in ten of us who have some kind of print disability, something that prevents us from effectively reading print because of a visual, physical, perceptual, cognitive learning disability, something like that. So um, in order to uh, 
you know, our, our main, um, our focus at Diagram and at Benetech is that we want all content that's born digital to also be born accessible. And in order to make a change that big, uh, we break our work into a few interlocking pieces. Uh, we start with standards because those are really the foundation of universal accessibility. Without standard formats and protocols, um, achieving image accessibility across all publishers and all devices would be really difficult. We also work on software tools, and uh, we have several of them, but the most, uh, I think, well-known is called Poet. It's a free, open-source image description tool that makes it easier to create image description books, and it allows crowdsourcing of image descriptions. So in our Bookshare program, for example, we hold Describeathons where volunteers use Poet to create image descriptions for Bookshare books. And nearly 40,000, maybe more than 40,000 image descriptions have now been created that way. We also stay on the leading edge of what's coming next, and we have many research projects going on. Um, we don't have time to go into them here. I invite you to go to diagramcenter.org to read all about those. Um, we're working on haptics and 3D printing and other things. And so finally, uh, standards, tools, and research aren't enough. You really have to also have uh, training, and that's part of what we do as well. So in order to achieve uh, all of this, we've assembled a large community of experts uh, who are working on all these pieces. And what you're seeing on the screen here is a picture of all of us. It's about 40 people uh, assembled at a meeting about a year ago. We've got our hands raised in a cheer. There's a, even a, a cane flying in the air and uh, very confused-looking guide dogs in the foreground <laughs> wondering what all the hubbub is about. Um, but uh, this is really a good picture to show how um, committed we all are. Uh, our groups come from Google, Adobe, Pearson, Learning Ally, uh, National Braille Press, and many, many other places. So we are incredibly lucky to have many of them on this call today. Um, these are the people who had a hand in creating the Accessible Image Sample book. So with no further ado, I am going to stop talking and let you meet them. Um, first of all, I, I, so I, I want you to be able to associate a name uh, with a voice. So, so each, of, each of our presenters will introduce themselves uh, uh, quickly, starting with Susie. Hi, this is Susie Haynes. I am the Digital Content Manager at Benetech based in Palo Alto, California. Hi, this is Lucia Hasty. Um, I'm with Rocky Mountain Braille Associates in um, sunny and snowy Colorado. Hello, uh, I'm Steve Noble. With uh, I'm actually have a split personality, so I, uh, I'm at the University of Louisville. Then I also work for Bridge Multimedia. Hi, this is Elaine Ober. I'm with Pearson Higher Education in the Boston office. Hi everybody. This That's is Jeff. Great. Uh, this is Jeff Freed from the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH in Boston. And Brian sitting right next to Jeff. And Madeline Rothberg, also from the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And with that, I invite you to sit back, uh, relax, and enjoy our presentation, starting with Elaine Ober. Hi. Thanks, Julie, very much. Uh, this slide shows the title page for the Accessible Image Sample Book. The content working group that prepared it is really thrilled that the first version is finally ready, and Lucia, Steve, and I want to walk you through it today. But first, I'm going to give you just a little bit more background. The sample book is a free online resource developed to show some of the many options for creating accessible versions of digital images, especially those found in the instructional materials that the over 8 million students Julie mentioned use every day. These include maps, charts, graphs, diagrams, math expressions, photographs, and all kinds of other images. At the heart of this sample book are seven complex images, each one shown in the context of its surrounding text material and with commentary on how to make the image accessible in various ways. You'll even see the code that you would use to provide it in a digital book. Today, 
Technology affords us so many different ways for an image to be made accessible. These will include short and long descriptions, tactile graphics, mathematical markup language, which we refer to as MathML, sonification, audio description, and even 3D printing. But really, unless you're part of the accessibility community, you probably haven't had much chance to see, hear, touch, or otherwise interact with any of these alternatives. So the Diagram Center's Content Working Group decided that a digital book with real and rich examples could help content developers, teachers, AT specialists, and really anyone else involved in creating, producing, or delivering instructional materials to solve some of the technical, editorial, and pedagogical challenges that they face. So as we work through the examples in the sample book, You'll hear more about a variety of accessible alternatives and get to see them in action. Now I'll turn it over to Susie. Great. So when you start looking at these sample chapters, what are you going to find in there? Well, you're going to find example layouts. So you will see pictures of how the images and their accessible descriptions or whatever other treatment they got, how this would appear in a book. Uh, you'll find code snippets that are suitable for cutting and pasting and adapting into your own files as you, you start creating your own accessible media. You know, so we included source files for everything we did. They are in the download bundle that I will talk about later on, and they're also available on the diagram website so you can actually get the files that we use to create the images you will see. Now let's take a look at the first sample. Lucia? Hi. Um, the first simple one is a heart and lung diagram. Um, and this was taken from a middle school health textbook, a section on circulatory and respiratory systems. So the diagram shows the lungs and the heart, color-coded pathways for blood transport, um, and is surrounded by a number of text paragraphs that are numbered um, that supplement the diagram by explaining the process. Um, the an interesting piece with dealing with accessible images is that the text is part of the image. So therefore, um, no text-to-speech or screen reader um, that I know of is going to probably read it um, because it is, is image-based, not text-based. So that needs to be extracted and included um, in the text description um, as the whole thing is made accessible. Uh, this the particular graphic if you look at the text that's on the um, on the actual page, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see how much of that information is actually already explained in the text and how much of it needs uh, to have description about the diagram itself. Um, it, very often a description and a tactile graphic together um, will meet the needs of the student and make sure that it includes all this content. Elaine? Thanks, Lucia. Oops. Thanks, Lucia. Um, in deciding how you're going to make an image accessible, there's a lot to think about. Particularly, you have to think about what the student is expected to learn from the image, what grade level is it for, and what kind of background information the student might already have. This slide shows a map of Spain's North American empire in the late 18th century. It comes from a college-level history text. This image is not directly referenced in the surrounding narrative, but the text in the, uh, on the page does provide background information and context, so the image is meant to provide supplementary information. The content working group talked about this and decided that this image didn't need a tactile graphic in order to be made accessible. First of all, because it's a college text, we can assume that the reader has more experience with maps than a younger reader would have. And secondly, the purpose of this image, which is supplementary, is really just to identify the places that make up the Spanish Empire in North America and not to understand the spatial aspects of it. So the data can easily be understood from a table. So this image can be made accessible via text description short and long descriptive text, which are shown on this slide. They're kind of small and you can't see them very well, but they're here. 
Um, the short description describes the very first level of instructional meaning, which in this case is simply the location of the border. It also is really important because it lets students decide if they even want to go further into the image. And then the long description puts all the data into a navigable table. Now let's move on to image three. This slide shows a bar chart about institutional discrimination. It comes from a college-level sociology textbook. From the surrounding text, we learn that the student will be expected actually to interpret the data and to understand the relationships between the groups represented by the three bars in each um, grouping. From the image itself, we can see that there's embedded text. So that content has to be included in any description. So this image can be made accessible in two ways, by text description or a tactile graphic. Let's look first at the description. This image needs both a short description and a long description. There happen to be several equally effective ways to describe the image, so here are just two options. Just the way there are different modalities for making an image accessible, like the description and the tactile graphic, there can be variations within each technique. It isn't always black and white, so you just have to learn to be comfortable with that. As for the long description, again, that's the part that will deliver the data. There are a couple of equally effective um, ways to do it. You can do it as a list, where you see each group of three bars becomes its own list, or you can present it in a navigable table. And here you see how the embedded text of the, um, at the bottom of the graph becomes these column headings and the three bar headings become the side heads. Finally, here's a tactile graphic which can be created to make the image accessible. The tactile graphic will include what you see here, which is a key page in Braille to guide the reader through, through the image. And then, a tactile version of the graph and this one was output from a high-resolution graphics embosser um, with the actual data. And this is where the student will be able to feel the spatial relationships between the bars. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Steve to talk about math. Okay, thank you, Elaine. So, um, so as we were looking through various examples, of course, we wanted to be sure to cover mathematics. Uh, math is something you're going to cover anywhere in education. And so um, we, what we did in this case was we took a, a sample page from a beginning and intermediate algebra textbook. So, uh, and of course, there were plenty of pages we could have chosen, but we, uh, we went with one that had uh, both math notation and uh, also some graphs of equations because these are quite common in math textbooks. So, of course, the the, the uh, short version of uh, the presentation is to say that well, math notation should be encoded in math now. And then, Steve, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you try to be a little bit louder? Some folks are having trouble hearing you. Okay. Yes. I'll, uh, I'll, okay. So, um, uh, the short uh, uh, story is math notation could be encoded in math and math. Uh, graphs of equations and data sets can be uh, rendered either by using image descriptions or sonification. So we looked at both of these methods in the uh, in the book. Um, okay, so let's talk first of all about the uh, the math. So what we have um, the the, um, the screenshot that's uh, actually on the page is just a, a snippet from first of all where we looked at the math textbook itself and uh, those some notation that is provided there and then the uh, the, the bottom uh, screenshot is a, a snippet of the page showing the math ML where we included the code snippet in the page so in that case that was a a uh, 
math uh, expression, um, which we uh, included there, f of x equals 2x squared minus 4x plus 1, for instance. And so we show the math and L that would be used for creating that equation. So, uh, of course, math and L has uh, been adopted in both EPUB 3 and it's been in the DAISY uh, format for many years. So the ability to include math and L is uh, in, the, in the specification itself. We include samples in the book of how you would do that in both DAISY and EPUB specification. We also include uh, a, a complete uh, a set of information for the particular page. So it's a it's an HTML file plus MathML uh, file along with the uh, MP3 audio files that we use. So that is available together with the sample book that uh, you'll see. So the the issue, of course, with math has been that you know going back to the early days of digital materials um when people were creating content uh you know they had the characters that were available on the on the keyboard so uh you what did you do when you came up with square roots and fractions or greek characters well uh the the workaround of course many years back was simply include a graphic of that so a picture of a math equation of course there's no accessibility to the picture so you're going to have to go uh, further than that to make it accessible so if you do use mathml for the equation, then uh, you're able to uh, actually provide it uh, uh, in, in display format for those that are viewing it on the screen, as well as being able to turn it into the um, the, the kind of accessibility information the assistive technology needs, uh, synthetic speech, for instance, to turn that mathematical into uh, an actual spoken equation. So. Um, Let's talk now about the graph. So we had, uh, on this particular page, we had uh, uh, two different graphs of equations. And so this is a common thing that you run into in, uh, in algebra is actually graphing an equation. Now, in this case, the uh, we suggested two ways of doing this. One is using image descriptions, and the other is to use a sonification file. So let's talk about the image description. First, on this page, so we have uh, two uh, different uh, graphs that are displayed, and they're, they're very similar. They're, they're uh, parabolas. And so actually the text um, that, uh, on the page gave quite a bit of detail about these particular graphs. So there wasn't any point in doing a very extended description. So we included brief descriptions here. So, for instance, the first uh, equation graph was uh, given as a vertical parabola with the vertex at 1, comma, negative 1. The second graph uh, included a little bit more information, so we had uh, a little bit longer brief description, a vertical parabola with the vertex at 0, uh, comma, negative 1. The parabola cross crosses the following points, 1, comma, 0, negative 1, comma, 0, 2, comma, 3, and negative 2. Common three, so that was using image descriptions. Well, another uh, capability when you're using digital material, of course, is to um, do something interesting with it. Is, is uh, using uh, kind of the technique that's been used uh, in audio graphing. So, uh, blind students, for instance, uh, may be used to using audio graphing uh, calculators. And essentially, what they do is they use uh, pitch to indicate sort of the position of a uh, of the point as it passes on the line that's being graphed. So as the line is going down, the pitch will go down. As the line is going up, the pitch will go up. Uh, you can actually produce these um, sonification files quite easily using the math, math tracks application, and we include a, a link to that resource. Um, and that will uh, provide, a, that's, a, that's a, a free resource that actually NASA created uh, several years back. And... Uh, so I'll, I'll just give you an example of what the sonification does for the first graph. So I'm just going to play that uh, very quickly. Okay, so you, you could hear the, uh, the, uh, the pitch going down and then back up again. And also it created other uh, tonal information that the student gets used to listening when it crosses particular 
uh, points on the x y uh, coordinate so the um the next one uh sounds like that it's a gets a bit um, more uh, line being covered so it's a little bit longer file so uh so that's another way of uh providing that obviously you could also uh for some students if you needed to you could you could take those out and uh and create um a raised line uh, drawing uh, a tactile out of, of these as well uh if you needed to but there since there are several in this particular book these are ways of providing uh very quick access to it um both using image descriptions and the sonification file. So I'm going to pass on now to sample five with our next person, Elaine. Hi, this is Lucia. Um, this is a unique example, and it's from an informal, from a, actually a, a formal assessment. Um, this sample five is angles on a survey map. And what you see on the slide is a page from um, um, a standardized test um, that has both the questions and the answer choices and the diagram. This one happens to be math. The um, U.S. copyright laws require explicit permission of a publisher to reproduce content um, from um, copyrighted assessments, and that's a little different from other from books and other kinds of educational materials. We need to pay careful attention as well once the publisher says, okay, you can produce it in Braille or in a description or in whatever, that we've maintained the scope of what is actually being tested as opposed to what appears to just be there on the screen. Um, so it's not permissible to um, to do this reproduction without uh, without the publisher's permission. Um, okay. Um, on, the, on the next slide, what you see is a text or an audio description, and if this is done um, as a, an alt tag or if it's done as a long description, it will be read because there are not any math symbols in it that um, a screen reader or a text-to-speech cannot read. Um, so a description might work for this particular thing. Again, you need to look at what's being tested and what tasks the student is being asked to do. Also, on the right-hand side is... Um, a type of the image of, of a tactile graphic, um, and you can tell that it's considerably simplified in that um, of this um, surveying crew is measuring across a river, and there are extraneous trees and other extraneous things um, in the print image that are not put into the um, into the braille image. Elaine, Yo, Lucia. So this is um, the sixth sample image. And this slide shows a schematic drawing of a carbon atom. It's from a college chemistry book. So in this example, the labels that are below the drawing, and there's this drawing, and then there's a second drawing, which I didn't show you on the left, um, they are most likely embedded in the image, so they won't be read by the user's assistive technology. That means that the information they provide will have to be included elsewhere, either in the image description or as braille labels on a tactile graphic, like the one you just saw in Lucia's example, or on a 3D object. This long caption, though, that you see here on the right-hand side of the uh, contextual page is live text. It doesn't explain the image, but it does provide background and context, and the student will be able to use that when reading or listening to a text description of the image or interacting with a tactile graphic or 3D object. All of these would be perfectly wonderful ways to make this particular image accessible. So in the other examples, you've seen descriptions and you've seen some pictures of what a tactile graphic would look like. Um, so we thought for this example, we would show you what a 3D object would look like. This particular one was created from a file that was built using specialized um, CAD or CAM software. And obviously, the person who um, printed it out had to have a 3D printer available um, in order to do that. And 3D printers are becoming much more common and schools often have them, 
colleges and universities often have them. So in the sample book, we've given you links to more information about 3D image files, including where you can find some that are ready for download, and also about 3D printing in general. And now I'm going to turn it back to Lucia. Okay, uh, sample seven is about decorative and redundant images. And it is absolutely amazing how many of them are actually in textbooks. I uh, recently did um, sort of an overview for a project, a subcontract project for a uh, diagram, and we discovered that there were an enormous amount of images that um, actually were not particularly useful. They do not need to be made accessible in this particular case. This is from a this page that is shown on the slide. This is from a literature textbook. And the first image is of a graphic of an open book. And that this little icon is used throughout the book, the um, whole textbook to explain that there, to show that there is a set of activities at the end of each chapter. The second image on that page is a photograph of an author that is sort of embedded in the middle of a little bio. Um, and transferring photographs um, is, a diff is a very subjective kind of thing to do. So that one also does not need to be made accessible. They both do, however, need to be tagged so that the screen reader will know that it's null and it doesn't read anything. Otherwise, it'll say image, 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 which we don't want it to do. So throughout this um, this discussion of all these samples, we've you've heard us mention several times um, how you decide what form works best for an image's accessibility. And I just want to reiterate several of the considerations. I think Elaine started off with us. So what is the purpose of the image? Is the reader supposed to do something with it, gather some data from it, understand a concept from it, or just know that here comes a chapter test? Um, what does the image, uh, does the image add additional information um, to the text? Is it already explained in the text, or does it have a whole, a whole lot of content that is not explained in the text? And then the age and the experience of the reader. Um, as Elaine was explaining about a map in a higher education textbook, um, probably not needing nearly as much details and explanation as it would if it were in an elementary textbook. Um, so always consider those criteria when you're thinking about what needs to be made accessible. And now that we've seen all seven samples of the uh, accessibility books, how do you get a copy for yourself? Well, it's available from the URL that you see on this, this slide at the Diagram website. It's available as EPUB2, EPUB3, and a zip file of good old-fashioned HTML. Um, if you're going to use the EPUB versions, feel free to use your uh, favorite EPUB reader. I've had good luck with the uh, extension to Firefox. There's a link to it here. If you're going to use the HTML bundle, just download it, unzip it, and open it in your web browser. It'll work just like a web page. Okay, thanks very much, Susie. Um, I just want everybody to know that uh, all of that information is going to be av is available on the web page at diagramcenter.org. Um, these slides are also going to be posted. And um, so is a recording of this webinar, a closed caption recording of the webinar uh, in, in about a week. So before we jump into the Q&A, and thank you for all these fantastic questions that are coming into the Q&A, before we do that, I just say a word about um, uh, the, the future of this book. We, uh, our, the authors have just gone over the seven samples that are there now. Um, that you can have and hold and, uh, and I hope use. Um, but we expect to update this sample book as new technologies emerge, and we know they are emerging from the research projects that are going on here at Diagram on haptics, interactive widgets, and, and a lot more. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming down the road. So in the meantime, we'd love to hear your feedback uh, about the sample book. Um, you can send us a note at the... Um, email on your screen, info at diagramcenter.org. Um, but uh, let's, before we conclude, uh, turn to your immediate questions. And so I'd like to um, turn it over to the folks at uh, WGBH 
to to feed us those questions and give us some answers. Hi, everybody. This is Jeff Freed at uh, NCAM at WGBH. Um, we've got a list of questions that people have asked in the chat windows, and we're going to run down those right now. If you have more questions, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat, and we will uh, answer those. Uh, the first question is, will the presentation be available to share with colleagues? And the answer is yes. Um, at some point after this session, Julie will be contacting all of you with information about um, getting access to the slides and to the audio, so that you'll be able to watch and listen uh, as well. Um, we have another question. Uh, someone is wondering why the authors of the books don't include image descriptions. It makes sense because they would be in the perfect position to provide the descriptions mm -hmm. uh, because they know why they used the images and what the context was. I think, um, Brian, you want to take a swing at that? Well, sure. I mean, the easy answer, which isn't um, totally satisfying, but I think it's the most true, is that it's simply not in the um, publishing work process right now. It's not something authors are asked to do. Um, and so usually somewhere an editor or another writer somewhere down the line in the publishing process winds up doing the uh, description of the images. And <clears throat> in fact, uh, it does take sometimes some reverse engineering or, or trying to figure out why the image is there, what the purpose is, and how best to describe it, especially in the context that it appears uh, in the book or, or, the, uh, or the resource. Um, we'll see as, uh, hopefully as, accessible digital books become more and more, um, uh, there's, well, there's more and more of them out there, and, and books that, uh, as we say, are born digital are also born accessible, then hopefully that um, task of creating the image descriptions will move up the back upstream and reside somewhere in the authoring process. But for now, it's usually um, someone much closer to the end of the process or even an outside agency uh, who's hired on um, to create the image descriptions. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brian. Um, somebody else has asked a question about MathML support um, in Microsoft. Microsoft announced that IE will no longer support MathML, and Google has done the same. So what should we be using to read MathML? In IE 11, um, MathML support has been eliminated, and also, if I'm not incorrect, uh, IE 11 eliminates support for plugins, which would mean that you couldn't use a plugin like MathPlayer to display MathML in IE, which is how a lot of people do it. Um, that being the case, one solution is to use MathJax, which is a JavaScript library that can be used um, pretty simply to display uh, MathML, it's MathJax, M-A-T-H-J-A-X. If you just Google that, you'll find um, a very uh, detailed website from the MathJax people about using MathJax and MathML. And essentially what happens with MathJax is that you, in your HTML, you write a reference uh, at the top of the file to the MathJax JavaScript library, and then you simply insert the MathML uh, markup into your document, and um, a browser like Firefox, uh, IE, Google, I mean uh, Chrome, Safari, just about any browser will um, display the MathML using MathJax, and um, it will look identical across all browsers. And you can also do other things with MathJax, like uh, scale the equations um, and some other things. But since IE is eliminating support for native MathML, that's going to be uh, one approach that I think a lot of people are going to be using. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, the, the um, uh, what you mentioned is essentially correct. And uh, so MathJax is a, is a good way of uh, uh, providing support for uh, MathML display in essentially any browser. And uh, I know that the uh, folks at Design Science are working on a uh, new release of MathPlayer, which will actually be uh, um, essentially uh, not dependent upon uh, platforms. So it would uh, uh, it would not necessarily be dependent on the browser. Um, so 
whenever that gets out, that will be also very useful for uh, accessibility purposes. Hi, Jeff. This this is Anne Bui um, from Benetech. Can everyone hear me, or can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to, uh, so for all the rest of you on the phone, um, I, I um, am with Benetech, and I am uh, uh, lead of the Diagram Center here, um, and uh, so work with Julie and others. And I just wanted to add a couple of things on mass. Um, so the first thing is one of the interesting idiosyncrasies of Chrome is that Chrome Vox, which is the um, screen reading extension of Chrome, um, which Google has uh, released, does in fact support MassML so that you can actually hear it spoken as uh, transcribed mass, even though visually it doesn't render. So it's, it's an interesting um, loophole, um, but one that I think hopefully points to a direction that perhaps Chrome will, will uh, see as a good one. The other thing I wanted to note is that um, we recognize that this gap between what publishers use or would like to use, like MassML, and what reading tools and software are available to actually render that MassML um, accessibly, there, that gap is large still. And so one of the projects that um, we've just been funded to do is something we're calling MassML Cloud which will take the MassML that um, a content producer creates and convert it into an image which is much more and almost universally uh, uh, um, able to be seen on, on a variety of different platforms, as well as a text transcription that can accompany that image um, for uh, some, some, uh, an audio rendering. Um, and then take the, the original MassML and store it in the cloud for future purposes because, you know, as we heard in this uh, webinar today, we know that that MassML is like, extremely valuable um, as we explore new and better ways for end users to interact with that mass. So I just wanted to put out there that that's a project that we're working on um, that we should hopefully make a lot of progress on by this summer. Thanks, Dan. Um, moving on to the next question here. Uh, somebody's asking if we have any recommendations for retail readers like iBooks and Kindle. They don't support described by, uh, the ARIA property described by yet, or tactile graphics. Um, uh, that's true. Um, the Kindle, as far as I know, has no support for um, uh, ARIA properties iBooks actually does have some support, support for some ARIA properties, and I'm furiously trying to remember right now some tests that I did um, a while ago testing the use of described by in iBooks, and um, I think the best thing for me to do is to answer that question um, uh, after the fact. Um, I believe that Julie will be making the questions and answers available um, later on. Uh, with the other materials. So let me look into that before I give an answer, but I'm pretty sure that iBooks actually um, deserves credit there. As for um, other features like tactile graphics, um, Lucia, you might be in a better position to answer that question. To my knowledge, no one has worked at all on dealing with tactile graphics um, in the readers. Um, there is some work going on at Stanford um, in using smartphones and tactile graphics and um, a number of other university programs are working on um, having tactile surfaces. Um, so I'm thinking in the next year or so that probably is going to uh, come to being. I know the National Braille Press has been really sort of shepherding different programs that are working on having a tactile display that will that could, in fact, um, accept a file for a tactile graphics. So maybe in my lifetime it will come about. Um, right now it doesn't exist. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we got a lot of questions, so I'm going to uh, try and pick up the pace a little bit. Um, somebody's asking if MathML is uh, applicable or works with um, text-to-speech programs like Kurzweil uh, for math-based text. Steve, do you have an answer for that? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Kurzweil has it working in uh, Kurzweil 3000, uh, so they've got. Uh, I, I don't remember where they are on Kurzweil 1000. 
Uh, the 3,000 is primarily used by uh, students with learning disabilities, whereas the 1,000 is, is more marketed for blind uh, students. But, um, yeah, I don't remember where they are on, on 1,000. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, someone has asked, um, regarding MathML, how is it written? Does the writer actually do the coding? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, MathML is an XML language, and if you're familiar with XML, you know that you can write that using any text editor if you like to write code. Um, you can look at the MathML recommendation and go nuts. Um, but what most people do is they use um, some sort of editing application, and probably the one that most people are familiar with is MathType from Design Science, which is um, a plugin you can use with Word and many other applications to write math and export MathML. Um, there are others, too. There's um, an open source one called FireMath, which is a, an add-on to uh, Firefox, um, which you can use to write MathML. And if you do a search, there are others. Um, Steve, if you want to toss out a few, you're welcome to. Uh, well, I think you, you've covered probably most of them. Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, let's see, moving on. Uh, is MathML available for use in LMSs like Blackboard? Um, Blackboard has, I think, still uh, a, uh, a MathML editor in a sort of CMS-like fashion. So I'm pretty sure that Blackboard is supporting MathML. Um, but other LMSs, I'm not sure. Maybe Madeline or Steve? Uh, yeah, I would do. Well, I've I've put uh, MathML in Blackboard. You, uh, here at UL, we use Blackboard, and so you can, uh, uh, yeah, you can. I mean, the the, I think the the uh, I, I'm, what I'm not sure of is is the internal editor that uh, you know that it has a math editor with it. But if you if you just take a math uh, page that you've made from somewhere else, say use use a uh, Fire Math or or math type, and you create this uh, HTML uh, uh, page with MathML in it, and you uh, upload that to Blackboard, you're fine. And then it becomes just dependent on the browser, you know, what the what the student is using with the browser. The uh, Of course, the other way you can do it in Blackboard is simply to use MathJax, you know, and then, and then if, the, if the browser can pass MathML through uh, to the screen reader, then uh, then you're fine there, too. Okay. Uh, Lucia, I think the next question might be for you. Somebody's asking, how widely used are 3D printers in creating tactile graphics or images, and does it seem like a good investment for public schools? Actually, um, <clears throat> one of the um, people that works with um, Diagram King, um, Sue, has just recently completed a study on how much that is um, used in schools, and the next webinar, I believe, um, King is going to be talking about that. Um, it, I don't think it's terribly widely used yet, but I certainly think it's a wonderful tool to create an object as opposed to um, d um, having to go out and round one up or as opposed to doing just um, a tactile graphic um, all that doesn't have the dimension in it that it needs to happen. Okay, um, the next question is, uh, what's a smart image in the context of this discussion? Um, Brian, you want to? Sure, just pointing at me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if we've coined this phrase uh, in the, just in this group of uh, 250 of us or so. Um, the way I typically am using smart images, and I, he I hear it as I understand it, is it's an image, a digital image that's not just static. It contains information behind the scenes that you use some other uh, way to access it. And that's really what the sample book is showing, is that um, some students will see an image <clears throat> uh, on their screen, and that's just fine. And if it's a smart image, it also will have sonification, or it'll have an SVG attached to it through which you can print out a tactile graphic, or it has description that's attached to it, or it has other information that makes it readily, or it makes it more accessible um, for all different types of students. Okay. Um, Steve, anybody else have anything to add to that? Lucia? Okay. Silence is consent. Um, why don't we move on to the next question? Um, 
Somebody's asking, uh, are there any guidelines or standards on making images themselves more accessible? For example, using textures in a chart versus colors to convey content. Um, let me take a stab at that first, and then I think others will have some answers too. Um, NCAM published uh, two or three years ago a very <coughs> excuse me, detailed set of guidelines for describing scientific images um, for digital talking books, DTBs, but the information offered there can be used really in any situation, any context where you have complex images of many different types. Um, if you go to ncam.wgbh.org, um, you can find those guidelines by clicking on the tools link and they will be listed on the next page. And we'll include that information maybe in the chat window. Um, uh, as for uh, guidelines on uh, using tactile features, Lucia, maybe you can uh, answer that? I can. Um, as far as producing tactile graphics, there is, in fact, essentially a Braille code for producing tactile graphics. It was approved by the Braille Authority of North America in uh, 2010. That is available, the actual code itself is available for um, free download from brailleauthority.org, O-R-G, slash T-G. Um, and you can either use an online version, which has links to a lot of examples, um, or you can use, you can download it and have it um, sit on your desktop or whatever it is you need to do with it. You can also order hard copy examples of the of the graphics um, from American Printing House for the blind. But yes, there is a... Um, there is a set of guidelines for um, how you decide what you're going to do as a tactile graphic, how much to include, and then how to go about doing that. Does that answer? Okay, yes. um, don't go away because the next question is for you, too. Somebody is asking, what applications do you use for producing tactile images like bar graphs or images in standardized tests? It depends on um, which what your output equipment is. Um, if you're looking, look, using a high um, resolution embosser, of which there are three on the U.S. market, um, you would use a software that would work for that. If you're using a um, capsule, um, microcapsule paper fuser, which um, some of those brand names are PIOF, Tactile Image Enhancer, Swell Four Machine, um, basically a, you print on a piece of special paper and it puffs up, then um, you can use a wide range of software, everything as from uh, feature-rich, something like Corel Draw, Adobe Illustrator, down to something as simple as, as Microsoft Word for those. Um, for the high-resolution um, embossers, um, um, each one of those has um, proprietary software. Well, two of them have their own proprietary software, the Phoenix by Enabling Technologies and um, Tiger Embossers um, by View Plus. The Index Embosser um, uses a program out of the Netherlands called Tactile View, which is a nice um, a drawing program for Braille graphics as well. Does that answer the question you're asking? Um, this is Jeff. I, I, I think it does. Um, if the person who asked that question, if you've got a follow-up, uh, you can type it into the chat window, and if we don't get to it uh, in the remaining time, I think we can get to it um, by writing an answer and then posting that with the presentation. But why don't we move on? Um, someone's asking, how is the contextual information separated from the content of the resource, I assume the image, and are there uh, and are there any metadata standards recommended to describe that context, Brian? What do you think? Uh, sure. And the simple answer is they're not separated from each other in terms of making the image uh, accessible. So, in other words, if you have a, a, a complex image or even image that's not that complex, it's going to have typically um, it'll have text on it, and of course that needs to be made accessible but also the context of the image, what's the learning objective for that image, what are the paragraphs that are surrounding it uh, about, is the image simply support for the information that's been provided in the text and therefore someone using a screen reader can read the text and then the image is just sort of uh, support for what they've just read, or is the image actually providing information that doesn't exist in the text and that's something that we find quite often. Um, in that case, uh, not only do, do the words that appear in the image have to be um, provided, but the context and uh, the information that's given graphically needs to be uh, quote-unquote translated, 
uh, into text so that the student can understand it. And, we, and that's what the sample book provides, as many examples of, of how to do that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, how does that? How does the student actually access that? Um, that's their their screen reader will find the underlying code and and either find um, all text or long description uh, or there's or other properties uh, like aria properties like described by uh, soon to be described at or labeled by. So that's the method with which you by which you would uh, get the the description content and then the content itself. Um, you know, needs to be needs to be added in into yep. the book. Into the book. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, moving on, we've got just a few minutes. Um, somebody's asking, does MathJax work with IE11? Yes, it does. Um, MathJax being a, a JavaScript library, which is called externally from the browser, like sort of like a, a style sheet, um, will work in just about any browser. Uh, any popular browser, and I think I said earlier that with MathJax, all the equations are rendered identically from one browser to the next. Browsers that render MathML natively, sometimes um, the symbols look differently, or look, look different from one browser to the next, or the numbers are represented in different fonts and things. Uh, but with MathJax, um, that, that problem or that feature is usually not evident. So yes, MathJax works with IE11. Uh, somebody's asking, what is the ebook viewer that was displayed in a screenshot on one of the slides? Elaine, was that um, caliber we were looking at? Um, the one that we used to grab these is uh, Calibre, which is a free download. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, and I think that answers someone else's question, uh, but maybe not. Elaine, maybe you can take this. Did you create your sample book in ePub format using Calibre or something else? That's actually a question for Susie. Susie. Yeah, um, I created an EPUB by hand. I'm old school. Nice. All right. <laughs> My kind of answer. All right. Um, someone else is asking, are there certain types of digital accessible textbooks that we should be advising our bookstores to use over others? Uh, and they give one example called Cafe Scribe. Um, I actually don't know. I'll open that up to all of the presenters. Anybody have any ideas for that? Uh, well, uh, Steve. This... Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, I, I was just going to say, uh, well, the, there's certainly, uh, we do have someone from Pearson on the phone, but Pearson uh, uh, has a, a, a HTML books, which are very accessible. They include uh, MathML uh, for the math expressions. Uh, uh, actually, on the higher ed side, the uh, Pearson Higher Ed has made the commitment that uh, all their textbooks beginning this year, uh, math textbooks, will include uh, MathML for the math, and they all already have quite a nice library available. But the, those, so those are all commercial, commercially produced uh, books uh, through Pearson that are available. And uh, yeah, I would certainly advise people if they're looking for. Especially in math, uh, you know, like accessible um, off-the-shelf books, those are some good to, uh, ones to choose from. And I'll just add that if you're looking for the um, the sort of generally available formats like Cafe Scribe or Vital Source or Course Smart, the best thing to do is to check with the um, with the vendor because the accessibility profiles of these things changes um, all the time because they're getting better and better. Uh, CourseSmart definitely has a good accessible reader for their product, and um, and I know VitalSource is doing a lot to make their eBooks more accessible, but it's almost impossible to keep up with them. Okay, Elaine, thank you very much. Um, we have run out of time, so on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you all for your questions, and I will turn it back to Julie for any closing statements. Julie? Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everybody, for a really wonderful discussion. Uh, I can tell by the questions that came through that there's a lot of interest in these topics, and I think we could have talked a lot longer. So what I'm going to do is prepare a written summary of the Q&A from uh, this session, and we will capture all the questions that we did not get to, and we will, we will provide an answer in written Q&A. So that will take us a few days to do, but I will certainly send everyone who registered for this webinar an email 
note when the recording and the slides and the written Q&A are posted. Uh, they will be there on our site, uh, freely available. You can share them with your colleagues, and uh, we hope that you'll use them. Uh, these slides also have links to um, further resources that you can explore on your own. And uh, if you enjoyed this webinar, you should know we have a library of about six or seven of them that have been conducted in the past. We do these quarterly. And as Lucia mentioned earlier, uh, the next one coming up will be on April 30th. And you won't want to miss that. It will be about uh, 3D printing of accessible educational materials, and there's a link in this slide uh, to register for that, and I will also be sending you an email about that. So with that, please join me in thanking very much these terrific presenters uh, for a wonderful webinar, and thank you for spending this hour with us, and we will see you next time. <laughs>